Let's go, baby. Welcome to the Athletes and Asses podcast. I'm your host, Noah Lack, and I bring on elite athletes to chat about a business topic, whether it's venture capital, retail, sales, crypto. Your favorite athletes know a lot more about business than you think, but how would you know that from just watching mainstream media? You're going to learn a topic of business here, but you're also going to learn a lot about the athletes themselves. Tune in. Please like, subscribe, give us a follow because we're bringing the heat. Let's get it. Deflected and it's intercepted. Chase Hansen with the pick off the deflection. Like it was fun just to feel healthy and go out and play football. I feel like I never left. Gets the carry, runs right into that blitz. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's go. This is another episode of the Athletes and Asses podcast. I'm joined by Chase Hansen, who was a former linebacker for the New Orleans Saints and is now an investor relations role at Thrive Development, a commercial real estate fund in Utah. Uh, you got to love that Utah real estate. I can't wait till we, we dive in and chat about some of the things you're up to, Chase. But we have to skip the small talk. Chase, I need you to give me your best Jameis Winston story. <laughs> Dude, I have, I have, I have dozens. Um, honestly, it's it's hard. What's hard for me is to not give a story that everyone else has seen. So I want to give you a unique one because we Please. died in the facility when he's talking about like the best running back condoms on, in the NFL or the best, like, you know, he's trying to say tandems or he's talking about like, I would say one of my favorite stories is... So I, this is kind of a side deal, but I lived in a camper van for one of the seasons in the parking lot of the team facility. Like it was, it was a weird thing. It was like a big team joke. I, yeah, I bought like a van, lived in it, was at the facility. So I was at the facility all day. Like I would just like hang out there. I was in the facility all the time. And one day I was there, um, I was just there in the hot tub, like late at night. And I just hear some, like someone like, belting it like singing their heart out throughout the facility and i'm like who in the world is this like singing so like there was no one else there and i'm like hearing it echoing throughout the facility and i'm like this is weird like who in the world is singing so loud and i go out and as a genius just like just like bel- like if you've if, like, if you played with him and you've been around him he's constantly singing like loud 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 and he's a decent singer but that's probably not a juicy one not a real great one but that's a good one. Oh, i have another one Yes, yeah, please. I actually do have another one. It was, it's hard because none of the stories do it justice. There was one practice where he was, um, I think Drew was the quarterback for the week and um, he was doing like the, like the look squad stuff. And so he was, if we were playing in running quarterback week that week, I don't know if it was Lamar, I don't know who it was, but he did like this zone read. And if you've seen him run, they like we call him crab legs because it just looks so funny the way he runs. <laughs> there was a play where he had a one-on-one with one of our defensive ends. I don't remember who it was, but he tried to like juke him. And our defensive our defensive end didn't move and he just stood there. And so they both just stood there and James just kept shaking and he shook like he tried to juke for like five full seconds. And it came it became a joke because then he just stopped. Like they both just, it was like a stalemate. They both just stood there and looked at each other. And it doesn't do it justice, but it's funny because he doesn't have any jukes, but he sat there like trying to juke our defensive end for way too long. And then they just stopped. And it's it's one of those things where if, yeah, if I could pull up the clip, it's so funny because he's just that kind of a person. Because at first he's serious. Like he thinks he's going to juke him, but he's just Jameis. I don't know. It's, man. He's one of my favorite guys I've ever played with. He's awesome. Was that in practice? Um, yeah. That you, yeah. Uh, uh, is, do you have a, I don't know, I'm sure you don't have access to, like, I, 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 do you have the clip of that? Or, or uh, if was I that could so- find the clip of it, I'll get okay. it to you. I, there's a good chance I recorded it and I saved it. So there's a good chance it's on my phone somewhere. So if I can find it, I'll give it, I'll get it to you. But I don't actually Pl- know if that's allowed. But if, if it is, I'll get it to you because it's. If- if it's a loud it's, man, please please share it. We'll we'll, we'll it's share it. It's so funny, man. Because he's serious, know. but he's not. Like he's yeah. such a character, and half the time you're like, I can't tell if he's being serious or not. Yeah, no, I. I oh man, I, I I am a football fan, so I can and I know like I can appreciate how funny that is because 
He's so just funny, Just the way man. he moves is like, it's just he like does. a little different. <laughs> it's just different. They, so yeah. you were you were living out of a camper van by the facility. Why? I'm weird, man. I, so this was my, the first year I got to New Orleans, I had multiple back surgeries and I was on NFIR, which means non-football injury. Yeah. And I didn't know if I was going to be there the next season. I didn't know if my back was going to hold up. I had heard of these guys going out and getting leases in New Orleans and then not making the team and um, like they got cut or then they had this lease and I'm kind of, um, I try to be very frugal and I'm like, I'm not going to go get a lease and they'd be paying for that when I'm back in Utah just because I didn't know if I was going to make the team. So I had this thing where I was like, I'm just going to live in a van. Went and talked to some people in New Orleans. was like, I would love to, you know, I bought a van. My parents actually drove for me to Arizona. Some guys built it out. They killed it. And then I drew, drove it out to New Orleans, lived in the parking lot. Wow. Uh, just parked it in the parking lot and lived in the van. It became kind of a whole team joke. There's a lot of details there. But yeah, I just lived in it because I didn't know if I was going to make the team. I did make the team. And then I was like, I kind of like being in the van. So wow. I stayed That's in the it. van, stayed in the parking lot until uh, our GM, Mickey Loomis, actually kicked me out of the parking lot. He's like, we can't, <laughs> like, we can't have you in the parking lot. Like, it's a bad look. <laughs> and so, yeah, I got, I got booted out of the parking lot late in the season. So, but I was there until pretty much the full season. And then uh, playoff time, I I yeah. got booted to a hotel. So any um any any team outings in the in the in the camper van? Uh, <laughs> any team camaraderie no. events in there? No, no, no one to go I, in man, there. Okay, everyone, no, everyone, everyone wanted to check it out. I don't know if you know Kiko Alonso, if you know that name. Yeah, of course. He loved the van, dude. He's he's like he's got this huge hippie side, like ultra ultra hippie, like loves that kind of stuff. I love, he's yeah he's one of my favorite dudes too. But he was always coming and checking out the van. He's like, dude. We could, we could, bro, we could like, we could take this, uh, like, we could drive this around the country. Like, what have you done to this? He was all for it. Guys would come check it out. There was this little skit, like, once a week, we had this thing called Craig's Corners. Craig Robinson, he'd put this thing on, and it was just kind of a spoof on like different players. And one yeah. of them was about the van, and it was pretty ridiculous. That was another video that's, yeah, they they got a good kick out of it. Nobody even knew I was living in the parking lot until late in the season, and then it became this big, <laughs> this big thing, like this big yeah, joke. Like, they're, they're like, they're like, where are you going? Like, oh my gosh, that's inc yeah. that's incredible, man. Well, I mean, to, to even make it at that level and perform is is incredible. Uh, let alone out of a <laughs> out of a camper van. Um, you know, throughout, if there was one thing that you wish people knew about, you know, your football career, your time in the NFL, maybe something people don't know about with it what it took for you to get there or maybe a, a, a best moment for you like what do you want to be remembered as it or what do you you know what's something people should remember about you cool question i like that um probably something i haven't thought about a ton myself but i would i would like to say just that i was resilient i mean i felt like i probably should have been done playing pretty early on just given the injuries and kind of the health struggles i had no excuses but it was, it was like the health stuff was tough for me. I, there, there were a lot of years I thought about hanging it, hanging it up and didn't. Um, and I guess I would want to be known as resilient and someone who every time I was on the field, like I, I, I put everything I could into it. Like even though I was reckless and I probably got hurt a lot of times because of it, I want to be known as someone that I played like a very specific style of football and it was reckless and it might have been a negative thing, but I put everything into it every time I was out there. And even though I wasn't out there a ton because of my health and injuries and stuff like that, yeah, my resilience and my ability just to go out there and play the game a very specific way every time because that's kind of the only way I knew how to play, which was a little reckless for hey. lack of a better term. I, I think you're. I think uh, the DC appreciate that. Pre appreciates that. A little reckless abandon. Get into the yeah. football. Is there a collision yeah. with um, a big time offensive player that you remember where you guys just went? Just you'll never forget that that contact that you had. You know, down the middle or maybe um, on the sideline. Me and um, well, Nick Chubb was the hardest person I ever had to tackle. I was in Cleveland and it was the coldest game I ever played in my life. And I was a linebacker and I was I had this big old knee brace on and 
I remember trying to tackle him and it felt like I was, you know, bringing down a bowl. It was it, like the, the, just the quad size was crazy. Um, I would also say me and, uh, train me and Latavius Murray had some big collisions in practice. I don't know why he and I always had a bunch, a bunch of, um, big, big collisions. I mean, he was a physical runner and I played downhill a lot. There were a lot, there were probably yeah. a lot of collisions, a lot of offensive linemen. Taron Armstead was, I mean, one of the best offensive linemen I ever played. And he was always, he was just fast. Like I would always try to go collide and he would just, just grab me. So I was, um, I was talking to, I had Ben Gardner on who had a stint with the Cowboys. Um, he, he was a, a, a D end and he was talking about how when he matched up with, with Derek Henry, he was like, this guy's bigger than me. Like these running, what are they feeding these running backs these days? You yeah, know man. what I mean? Yeah, man. They're, that, yeah, that's how it was. And the running backs, yes, but I think one of the biggest things for me when I got to the league was everyone was big, but I remember how athletic the offensive linemen were. Like, like the athleticism of the biggest guys was the craziest thing to me. Like, yeah, that like yeah, the backs are big, everyone's bigger, all that stuff, but like the huge dudes, the offensive linemen, so athletic. And that was crazy to me because I always kind of tried to use my athleticism in college. And then you get to a point in the NFL where you're like, I got to... I got to mix it up a little bit. Yeah, so. absolutely. absolutely. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you remember the first time in your career where an investment opportunity came about for you, whether it was in commercial real estate or maybe it was something different? Do you remember that like that first introduction to like that that moment in your mind where you were like, okay, maybe I could also make money elsewhere aside from my game check? Yeah, yeah, great question. I... I'd, so I'd, I didn't know much about the real estate investing world. I didn't know much about what I was going to do financially uh, when I made my money because at the time I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I make the money first? And so it wasn't probably until my second year in the NFL where I got put on to the Bigger Pockets podcast, which is you know the notorious real estate podcast, um, basically on real estate investing. And I had a buddy in the NFL who recommended it to me. And I just, I mean... Especially when I was on IR those that first year or two, I just was listening to that 24-7. And I got to a point where I'm like, I just want to, it was kind of my own thing where I said, I want to go get my own rental property. So I think it was my second year. I went and bought a rental property in here in Southern Utah, not far from um, Zion National Park in a good spot. And yeah, that was, that was the first big move I made financially, investing wise. And... Yeah, just kind of started with learning. Just try to listen and learn as much as I could because I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I wanted to put my money somewhere where it was going to start working for me. And I knew that I loved the investing world. And I loved the concept of, um, I mean, who doesn't? But the, the idea of starting to buy assets that that pay me back in financial free, long-term financial freedom. So that was the first move. The second and some of the third moves were really just investing with Thrive Development, the company that I'm currently with now. And that was appealing for, you know, a number of different reasons for me, but yeah. It, it was it because you're from Utah. Is that why you're so, like, you felt comfortable investing in Utah real estate early on? Yeah. And I'm, okay. I'm bullish, very bullish, like a lot of people on Utah in general. There's a lot yes. of opportunities here, even though stuff is overpriced. There's just, I think there's a lot of good that's going to come. I mean, not just the real estate world, but the startup world. Like, there's just so much going on and it's... It seemed like the right move. I, I looked outside of Utah because the returns, frankly, were a lot better outside of Utah and still are. But I think long term, it just makes a lot of sense for me to be in Utah, especially for my first couple business moves. I'm not the type of person who feels comfortable or felt comfortable buying out of state. Like it, it needed to be something I could physically see, be there, visit, put my hands on, try to add some value with. Well, that one was a, actually a new build, but with my other investments, I, yeah, especially right now, I'm still early in the investing game and it's, yeah, Utah's the spot for me. Oh, I definitely want to talk about the Utah real estate landscape, but it, there seems to be a trend, um, <clears throat> particularly in real estate. Like I had Josh Childress on a couple of weeks ago and he's from Compton, played in the NBA for a number of years, uh, from Compton, California, now lives in Orange County. But one of his first big investments with his real estate group, Landspire, was in Compton. Was a, mm -hmm. was a community project. And I think 
his it sounded like his level of familiarity with the area gave him confidence to take a chance where it almost feels like <clears throat> you're even though an investment is a risk, it feels like you mitigate risk knowing the backyard. Exactly. And I've I've had the last year or two, I've really branched out purely because I mean, every, everyone's struggling to find stuff that returns real well right now, but I really branched out and I was like, okay, I'm going to find the market that's going to make, that's really going to give me, you know, a great ROI. And I, I was looking in Nashville. I was looking in, you know, sh- Nashville. You know, I was looking at South Carolina. Nashville. I was, I was, I, I was looking at, I, I was looking at the South big time, just diff- different markets. I was looking in Texas and the returns were better but not good enough to where I just felt comfortable making the move. And, and, and some people might say that's maybe a bad thing, but to your point um, with Josh, I, I love the familiarity. I, I feel very confident that if I put my money in a very specific location in Utah, even if it's not going to make me, even if it's not going to immediately start cash flowing real estate wise, I feel really confident that being here, I know how to add value to it. I can increase its, you know, I can increase the value. I can, like, I, I can have the confidence that that's going to be a good long-term move where, you know, I, yeah, I haven't gotten to the point where I'm confident enough to make that kind of a move outside of Utah yet. I'm hoping to at some point, but right now that's, that's where I'm at. Coming soon, coming soon. It, just to provide uh, context for those listening, like, so Chase, you, you have uh, uh, quote unquote hung the cleats up, even though you are in game shape. So if yeah. any, if my, if well my said. Tex, yeah. if my Houston Texans, I'm a Houston guy, if my Houston Texans need an extra linebacker. Uh, I know a guy, uh, but cool. not <laughs> don't want to damper the fact that you have made a, an awesome transition working with, with Thrive. Can you describe to us uh, the company you work for? What is Thrive? What do you guys do? Cool. Yeah. So Thrive is essentially a commercial development company in Cottonwood Heights, Utah, I interned with them in college, had a great experience, loved the idea of it. Uh, They essentially built from ground up office, uh, medical offices, as well as large multifamily properties, um, mostly in the mountain areas, Utah, Idaho, Montana, New Mexico. That's kind of the, the target market. I invested with them in when I was playing ball in the NFL and had a great experience. They, 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 they're, they're guys that I just stayed in touch with really good, solid group of guys. Um, the property I invested in was in New Mexico and it's, it's been awesome so far. And, um, yeah, jumped on, just kept in contact the whole time I was playing, alluded to the fact that, Hey, I, w- I would love to end up at a place like this when I'm done. I love the idea. I love the 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 financial benefits i love the idea of networking and building and creating and building from the ground up and just the, the whole idea of the development world was appealing to me and so they brought me in about about a month ago so i'm still you know new guy on the block new, man you're the rookie all yeah. over again i am, I am. they brought again. me in in the investor relations <laughs> role so i'm essentially marketing networking helping fund these projects so yeah Quick plug to the the Thrive development world. Anyone who's interested in that, yeah, plug it in. If if if, if anybody's interested in putting their money into, you know, these large multifamily properties in the mountain areas, they can hit me up. They're awesome group of guys, super trustworthy. Like I said, I have my own money in there, and I, it's it's you know where I trust it to be. And so yeah, yeah that's and, that's and my quick plug. Yeah, absolutely. You're not a rookie to to Utah though, and and I think post pandemic Utah is no longer a secret, man. I mean, we touched on it a little bit. You got like Silicon Slopes, all all the tech companies sort of gathering around the greater Salt Lake, Park City area, uh, the real estate there, the neighborhoods that are sprouting. Um, I spent a lot of time there, so I'm familiar. You know, we 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 have a uh, I spent some time in in Park City and and see people from around the country uh, moving there. Um, it feels like Utah is on the rise for sort of that that second home, or maybe people relocating to, to you know to have a a different uh, pace of life. You know what I mean? It is no big time, and there's a lot of reasons for it in terms of the the appeal to Utah. I think the like you said, there's there's the real estate draw, which has only continued to grow because it's it's a 
beautiful place. And I think it's been kind of under the radar for a while. There's great skiing here. There's great outdoors in Southern Utah. There's, there's so much to do. And I'm, a part of me wants to almost downsell it because I love the small town Utah, but I yeah, feel no like it needs here. to be no upsold. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I feel <laughs> like it needs to be upsold just, just to do it justice because yeah, I mean, Utah's awesome. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Utah guy at heart and there's the, the, the growth is, yeah, it's, it's, it's super valid. And I, I think it's only going to continue, can continue to grow population wise, real estate wise, um, business wise. It's just so much opportunity here in my mind. There's two things. First of all, the what I notice about Utah that is so different from places around the country is the facilities, whether it's commercial, it's a gym, are top of the line. Like uh, I remember, like I used to work out at um, Basin Rec Center uh, in Park City, and yeah. the, ba- <clears throat> the so like I'm a basketball guy. The basketball court, <clears throat> there's two courts. But there was ten basket. There was ten goals. So there was like yeah. a hoop, a hoop on each side, and then two two on one side, two on the other side. Um, the astroturf. Um, there's a whole like indoor astroturf thing that Olympic, um, you know, Olympic teams from around the world were training at rugby even, um, mm-hmm. which is cl- which is close to football. And I'm just noticing that. Everything, the facilities are so top of the line. Uh, you guys from Utah really care about sort of the, you know, the, the gym rec space. I, that's one thing I noticed. We do. We do. And there, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of passion in the health and wellness world, which I love. Like, that's my space, too. I even started a little supplement company um, a few months back that we're trying to get off the ground. And then we're also, I feel like the sports world is really, I think it's really under the radar as well. I feel like it's in my mind again, I kind of want to keep it low key. So I'm trying to not overhype it, but I just, I think that the sports world is going to continue to grow. The projects that are being done real estate wise are just so well done. I feel like the real estate, the, the, the construction, the developers here are top tier companies, including Thrive. That's another really appealing part about what they do is their projects are so well done. Like they care about how it looks like they're, their reputation is Houston. They want to put. They want to build. You know, really high quality stuff that's going to last. That is well built. That is architecturally sound. That is. Anyways, that's its own tangent. But yes, Utah is big on the health space, the wellness space. I mean, it's a. I feel like we try to be a, a, a clean state. I got one. Yeah, uh, but I got one complaint though. Man, yeah. everything there seems like it closes at around 9 p.m. Man, I can't get, I can't go anywhere after 9 p.m. Man, it's <laughs> like night night. It's cookies and milk time. What the hell? Yeah, yeah. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta kind of take the good with the bad. Where the culture, you know, you got the, you got the church culture that's big in Utah. Sure. Everyone just goes home with their family. Like, like it's, it's a very specific culture where, you know, everyone goes hard. And then they go home and it's like, oh, you got to deal with it. Like, like we don't care about that life. Like we want, we, we want to do our thing during the day. We want to go to bed. We want to wake up early. And I'm not saying yeah. everybody's that way in Utah, but yeah, there is kind of this culture of, well, that's Utah. Like we go to bed early and that's how, that's kind of how it goes. Everyone's kind of going home and doing their thing. I got to make sure I get dinner early, man. Cause I'm going to get, I'm going to get uh, kicked out of the, of these restaurants, <laughs> man. Closing early. <laughs> I know if if you have any plans after 9 p.m., forget about scrap it. Em. Like you scrap them, no, scrap them. You better be going to the Subway, Walmart, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, there's you better yeah. go to like the uh, the St. Regis Hotel lobby in Deer Valley. That's probably the only thing that's a, a, it's a good spot, at, though. <laughs> yeah, it is good spot, though. Very, very, very good spot. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, and your role specifically, Chase, investor relations. Um, Investor relations uh, can be applied to not only real estate. There's, you know, obviously you can do it in venture. Um, there's, there's other forms of this. But for you specifically, love to like hear about your role. And, and I know it's been a relatively new journey for you. But what does your role entail? How do you help thrive? Thrive, pun intended. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. Well done. You like that one? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, yeah. Let me just start by saying, as you mentioned, I'm still so new. And I'm still getting my feet wet. And the bulk of the Thrive uh, community, the, the the foundation of Thrive, the guys that started it, the guys that really run the ship, they have a lot more knowledge than I do. So I don't want anyone thinking that I'm like the backbone of knowledge at Thrive. But it 
has been an awesome start and I'm learning a ton, man. And my role at this point is basically to learn as much as I can about what we're doing, how we're doing it, and then go help fund the deals. It's, it's, it's cool because like I said earlier, it's an easy pitch for me because I believe in the concept. I'm invested in the company personally and I'm basically going out networking. I'm going out and meeting as many people as I can. I, I, I literally have never golfed in my life until about two weeks ago. <laughs> and they said, they, they said, Chase, you got to learn how to golf. Like we're going golf. I'm like, you got to be able to meet people. You got to network. You got to connect. And I, I mean, it was bad, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. So basically my job is, is to connect. It's, it's to take my skill set, which I believe is in part, part of it is people and to be able to take that into the business world, which has been awesome. And it's honestly been for lack of a better term, a blessing for me because it's allowed, it's kind of forced me to go connect with as many people as I can. And it's been awesome. And just to, to kind of deepen connections. And to improve your short game. Exactly. Your putting. And all, my whole game, my entire game. <laughs> the entire game, start. okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, okay. it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a whole thing. But that's pretty cool, man. I, I, like just, if case anyone missed that, um, aside from, you know, the technical stuff you mentioned, you actually need to be better at golf. And I think like you're, you will be much better at your job. Isn't that crazy to think about? But that's like a cool burden. It, it is. It is. And that's what I've, that's what I've, when I've, when I've kind of given that pitch to like family or friends talked about like, okay, well, what are you doing right now? I'm like, well, I'm learning how to golf. So there's like, that's step one. They're like, what are you like? What is your job? Go to the driving range. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it it, I, it sounds overly simple, but I think the reason that I am excited about it because it really is just like just connect with people, like no, and, and it's it's going to be something that carries over to if I'm not at Thrive Forever, it's going to be something that's a benefit for you know the rest of my life, and I think it's going to carry over to any career. And I think looking back, I could have done a much better job of just like connecting with people. Networking in a way that's not, it's not salesy. It's just creating a connection, you know, having these cool experiences together, doing cool things with cool people, and then finding ways to add value for each other. So, you know, my value add would be, we have these awesome projects. They're going to get, you know, that are going to be huge benefits to your tax savings. They're going to be beneficial in terms of your returns, financial um, financial returns and taxes, like there's, there's all these benefits to each project and you know, you're going to benefit us because you're bringing money into the deal that we're trying to raise for. And so I think that's a cool part of the eco ecosystem, the business world is you're adding value to each other. And that's, you know, been a part of my learning process of understanding the deals, being able to communicate them properly. I think your best selling point once again is your best selling point is that the fact you're invested in the fund. I think yeah. that speaks volumes. Is that a commonplace amongst other investor relation managers you know across different funds and different real estate, you know, syndicate funds? It seems like I don't know if that's obvious, but to tell someone, yeah, I'm in the I, I I'm invested in it, you know what I mean? I've skin in the yeah. game. Yeah. Well, I think that's where I think that's where people get skeptical at times when you start talking about the projects and they're like, okay, so what's in it for you? And my response is always, because I think people, especially when they're not like, and if there's not this really great foundation of trust and you're just having the business conversation, which sometimes that happens, the immediate, like, the immediate question from someone who's going to potentially put their money in the deal is like, like, what's the catch here? And I've always felt like the like the best way to go about that stuff is to be super transparent. It's like, well, here's the deal. We do benefit when you bring money into projects, me and in investor relations, because we are like as a company earning money when we're funding the projects. Like there's bonuses that are going out. But the other catch is if I were to receive a bonus of any sort, I'm putting that back into the project because that's where I want my money to be. You know what I mean? So it's like, whether or not you putting in the money benefits me, it's going to benefit both of us because both of our money is going to end up in this project that we're both going to benefit from in the long term. So to your point, I think it is a huge, um, a huge selling point just to be able to say, A, my money's already in the deal. B, 
if I were to get more money from anything in this project, I'm just going to put it right back in because that's where I want all my money to be. And that's where I think it becomes, you know, an easy conversation. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And uh, Chase, I, f I have a, a hunch you're, you're going to be good at this, but I want to put you to the test if you don't mind. Um, I, go for uh, it, man. We'll, yeah, I'm man. a little nervous, but go for it. <laughs> yeah. I've, 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 yeah, to really be tested. So. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you know, um, I hope I'm not as intimidating as Nick Chubb uh, on a cold Cleveland Sunday. So I, 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 I don't know. I don't, I don't know if this will be as bad, but um, I am interested in investing in the next project or a, a current project that you guys are seeking funding for. Can you pitch to me a project you guys are actually going to want to put money into and, and why I should uh, be a part of this? I don't know if I could pitch you a specific project, but I could pitch you the general overview of a project. I don't know if I could get into the weeds of it. Again, okay. probably whatever, something I should or shouldn't know. What, but, what, what, whatever you can dive into. Okay. I can pitch you on a project that I just put my own money into, actually, just barely. It's a project that was... We just... It, basically, it was a project that... Our, it's... Uh, a covered land play, which essentially means that we're buying the land and it already has assets on it that are paying for the land. So we're not, you know, we're not in any sort of a crunch to really, there's, it's, it, there's not huge risk basically. And so we got it reappraised. It appraised for a lot more than it initially appraised for. It's going to be a three-year exit, a, a potential 20% IRR, and a, and a quick exit on the cash. So if, if, you, if you are somebody who wants to get their money out quick, it's a great opportunity, great project. If you're someone who wants the long-term play in the tax benefits, we have another project where if you keep it in long enough, it's in, it's in a zone called an opportunity zone, which essentially would allow you, if, if you had capital gains, you could put your money into that project, keep it in for long enough, you're, you're pulling that out tax-free. So if you have a lot of, capital gains that you want to shelter, the ben the tax benefits are huge there. So there's two different projects. You have the ones that are, that's quick exit, quick return. You're getting a 15 to 20% return anticipated. Um, three, three, you know, three year exit in this longer term project. It's more for a very specific investor. Again, tax, you know, tax free pullout. If you have the capital gains because it's in an opportunity zone. I so like that's that. my, that's my, that's my quick spiel, which needs a lot of work, Noah. Hey, but I mean, look, I, I like <laughs> I like what you did there. You just gave me a menu of options. You said, here, here's the appetizer, but I can give you the whole meal if, if, uh, if you're yeah. looking for some diversification. <laughs> what, it, what it needs is work. And the, the reality is, if I got the nitty gritty questions, I'd say, here's the deal, man. I believe in the project. I'm invested in myself. It's a great opportunity. Let me have you sit down with our guys. Like, let me have you sit down with our project managers, the guys that really understand the deals and they can answer your questions on a much higher level. But yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would really get to if I, if I had someone like yourself who really wanted to know the nitty gritties of certain deals. Otherwise, I'd basically just speak to the credibility of the company, the projects, the fact that, and, and their history. So, but this, the, 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 the pitch needs some work for sure. Oh, for sure. But uh, you know, you know what, Chase? I would be fascinated to have you back on in like four months and see how, cool. how like refined in your your pitches and how much you've learned in like that period of time. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, uh, be, man, I, I like I like that plan. Yeah, that'd be that'd be very interesting. Um, that would be your role. Um, it seems tailor made for an athlete. It really does. I feel like that because of your network, your experience. Um, your, your ability to learn, um, it just, it feels tailor-made for, for athletes. What, what advice or what game would you give to athletes, um, looking for a kind of role like this, which feels sort of <clears throat> like sales mixed in with investor, but, um, you know, networking with a purpose, um, you know, how would you give athletes advice on how to source this, these kind of opportunities? I would probably just not not to beat a dead horse, but I would I would probably get give the advice that I've been given, which is essentially as you go about your athletic career, look for any opportunity you can to network. And I think 
when I heard that word, when I was playing, I was like, what do you mean by network? Do you just mean meet people? Like, why would anybody really be interested in forming a real deep connection or not even a deep connection? But like, why would anyone really want to network unless I, you know, had an investment for them? When in reality, sometimes that just means become friends with a lot of people, you know, do cool stuff with a lot of cool people and keep that base level connection because you know, it's, it's those connections that are going to benefit you in the long term. I also think being able to add value to those people and what they're doing is huge. You know, if, if you can go speak, if you can go coach, you know, if you can go do something within your skill set that adds value to them, their organization, their little league football team, when, you know, whatever it is. I think those are great opportunities to network as well, where you're adding value and in turn, it's only going to want to, you know, it's only going to open the door for them to be able to add value to you as well. And so not that it's a transactional relationship and it shouldn't be treated that way in terms of the networking process, but I think it just allows you to network with a little bit more purpose and to be able to get, just, just become close. You just build closer relationships with people. Were you a social butterfly in college? Is that where it started or it was at the NFL? Uh, I was kind of, honestly, I wasn't, I, I'm an introverted extrovert. Like I like my alone time. I do a lot of stuff alone. I'm weird to the point where I'm like, I'm living in a van by myself, you know, <laughs> but I love Respect. people. Yeah. I love people. I have these, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a bit conflicting, but I love people and I've always loved being around people that I really connect with. And I've found a lot of value in those experiences. So I think it's just finding a balance. I think later in high school, I really came out of my shell. College, I was kind of anti-social social. So, and that's kind of just my whole story. But yeah, a little bit of both. Yeah. Well, hey, Chase, we need to go uh, golfing uh, in Promontory in, uh, in Park City. I don't know how let's, far you are. Let's make it happen. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm down. I'm about 45 minutes, but I'm, yeah. I'm game. Once I, I need to go to Top Golf a few more times before we can do that. <laughs> Top <They're> Golf, really, <laughs> dude. I That's need not, to. I don't think Top Golf is the answer. I think you should go to like a normal driving range where, like, anyways. Uh, yeah, yeah I don't know, bro. Have you been to Top Golf? Have you played the Angry Birds game? <laughs> I have not played it, the Angry Birds. It, it Bird. is effective. It's effective. Really? It forces you, man. It forces you to aim. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I just know that I got to I got to learn how to swing the club first, and Top Golf is kind of helping with that. Top Top Golf, so Top Golf has been helping you genuinely um, with with your game versus like going on a normal range using. Yes, and, I mean, yes, yes and, no. and no, not really. Okay, but I've never I've just never really golfed, and so now I'm like starting to go. I'm looking for any excuse I can to go to Top Golf, golf driving range, anything like that. So, yes and no. Okay. Okay, well, I mean, I'm serious. We we should definitely hit the links, man. But um, yeah, man, man, I really, I really, really appreciate your time. It's been another great episode with um, former NFL linebacker Chase Hansen, who is now investor relations manager at Thrive Development. Um, Chase, uh, good luck. Congratulations on the transition, first of all. But good luck in your journey, and we look forward to having you on in a couple more in a couple months to uh, see that pitch. Appreciate it, man. Looking forward to it. Thanks, though.